Our next speaker is Captain Roy Ragsdale. He's currently a member of the Cyber Mission Force and has not only served as company commander in the 782nd MI Battalion, but is also trained as an operator. Captain Ragsdale commissioned as a military intelligence officer from the United States Military Academy, where he majored in computer science. He eagerly anticipates beginning grad school this summer with a follow-on assignment at the Army Cyber Institute. Here is our next speaker, Captain Roy Ragsdale. Good morning. I'm, I'm thrilled to be speaking here. I, I have to say it might be just a little bit sad if that's his one claim to fame is having changed my diaper, though. I, mean, I, I wasn't expecting that this morning. <laughs> uh, so looking forward, though, uh, in the theme of cyber talks, I'd like to tackle uh, perhaps that question asked before, of the art of cyber, uh, trying to tackle from first principles how we understand and reason and discuss in this domain. And so if, uh, move forward, or I guess I can do that. <laughs> All right, so uh, truly, uh, Brent told a little bit about my background, uh, but really it's the people behind that who I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to thank. And so you, you heard him mention, first I must thank my father. He instilled this great enthusiasm for me. And he's the one who's been at the end of all these rants and thoughts uh, that have hopefully distilled in a more uh, digestible manner here today. I'd also must thank uh, Colonel Conti uh, for serving as my advisor at West Point and all that he's done to drive this forward. The vision that he has for the future over a long period of time uh, that you see here in the Army and Cyber Institute. I owe a great debt of gratitude to him. Uh, commissioned as a military intelligence officer and am covetous of those uh, 17 series uh, insignia sitting there. I uh, owe a great debt of gratitude as well to all those who have fought that long, hard fight uh, to make this dream a reality. I'm incredibly fortunate to be a part of it. Uh, additionally, I must thank uh, both my battalion commander and my brigade commander, Lieutenant Colonel Quatrain, Colonel Hartman, and formerly Colonel Buckner, uh, for their vision that they've had to provide technical experiences for junior officers and the value that they've seen and how that uh, enables leadership in the domain. Uh, the views in this talk are my own, uh, not those of my bosses, the Department of Defense or the Army, but I do hope that you steal them, uh, change them, and, and, and start a discussion here. In 20 minutes, I can only hope to touch on the uh, briefest framework that I'd like to lay out, uh, but hope to start a discussion. So if we look to the media, uh, who here has seen CSI Cyber? And we'll admit it. <laughs> two episodes? Anybody? Anybody hung in? All right, so if uh, <laughs> I'm in the two episode camp. Uh, so if we were to listen to Agent Ryan from that show, uh, you'd get this incredibly broad definition of cyber. You know, quite literally, everything and anything uh, would fall in her bin and her responsibility. And so I'd argue that if everything is cyber, then well, maybe nothing is cyber. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, noted pop musician and uh, security enthusiast Taylor Swift, Info InfoSec Taylor Swift, uh, she would argue that a whole lot of people are talking about cyber, uh, but maybe they don't know what they're talking about. And so hopefully we can uh, build upon that, and I would argue that as professionals in the domain, that would be our position and role uh, to try and determine from deep principles what it is when we say cyber, uh, what it means, and how we go forward from there. Uh, fortunately, one of the most uh, profound things to happen in recent time is the identification of cyber as a domain of warfare. That's an incredibly crystallizing thing that helps us put it on par with other uh, domains such as land, sea, space, and air. Uh, however, when you turn to the joint publications, which uh, don't get me wrong, it's fantastic that we have uh, publications on this and we are starting to define the domain, uh, but weighing in at 70 pages, over 500 cybers, and six references to the word code, unfortunately all of which reference to the U.S. code, um, you know, may not be that uh, you know, succinct, crystallizing uh, message on, on how we get after cyber. All too often, then, we're left to reason about cyber by analogy. Uh, surely you've uh, been in an experience where someone's saying, cyber's just like SIGINT, or cyber's just like communications. Maybe in industry, cyber's just like information assurance. And, and metaphors and analogies are helpful. Uh, sometimes they can be incredibly evocative. Uh, cyber Pearl Harbor is an example. Uh, but all too often, if we're not building the right metaphors uh, from a deep foundation, uh, we can find ourselves in, in a world of hurt. Uh, here's a potential use case or example. Uh, pulled j straight from the joint publication, uh, you see the definition of cyber as having a number of different layers. If, if you look through that, uh, you know, what else has layers? Onions have layers. All right, so now we're starting to make some progress here. We can turn to another noted luminary in the field, Shrek, who, who gets us that critical piece that onions are like ogres or like layers uh, because they all have layers. And so by uh, analogy there, we finally reach a point where cyber is Shrek. It's just like Shrek. And, uh, so this may be a contrived example, uh, but it's certainly 
potentially not too dissimilar from how we sometimes think and reason about the domain. If you've ever used the term cyber bullets, cyber grenade, or cyber nuke, uh, I would argue potentially we're falling into the trap uh, that InfoSec Taylor Swift describes of maybe not understanding what we're talking about. Uh, and so please, uh, at least if you consider yourself a security <laughs> professional, uh, I, I'd ask that you would strive uh, to develop those deep understandings and strong uh, basis in order to build worthwhile metaphors. Uh, oftentimes to interact with other domains and to be a part of the combined arms fight, it's important that we're able to explain our domain. Uh, we're much more powerful when we're explaining that from first principles uh, than potentially by metaphor. And so cyber, uh, in the famous words of Inigo Montoya, I'm not quite sure I think it means what you think it means. Uh, this, fortunately, uh, there are others in the community who are having this same debate and same thinking. Just last week, uh, Rob Graham of Eratosec and Kevin Mahaffey of uh, Lookout Security uh, had this exchange uh, claiming that we should understand cyber uh, not from analogies, uh, but must reason about it in first principles. And so that's what I'll seek to do here today. Uh, I think there's a fantastic um, depth of knowledge and people we can turn to. If you look at Turing Award winner Dijkstra here, uh, describing, talking about computer science, but really the foundations of the domain, and how when faced with novelty uh, and sharp discontinuity, we must no longer reason by analogy or metaphor, but seek to understand uh, not with that common sense or past experience. And so this is a man who knows about the shortest path. All right, when that joke hits, we'll, we'll finally have arrived in this domain. <laughs> All right, so uh, another uh, great thinker of our times, Elon Musk, creator of SpaceX and Tesla, uh, you know, has a similar saying uh, that we must reason from first principles rather than by analogy. Uh, looking towards the lessons of science, uh, we see in, in not just physics but many of the sciences uh, this very virtuous cycle of reasoning from logic and laws and theorems combined with ex uh, real world experience and experimentation. Uh, this virtuous cycle is something that I think we can learn from in uh, the cyber domain as we seek to lay out first principles. I'd argue that fortunately it's a man-made domain, so you and I don't need to be an Einstein or a Newton to try and reason from these first principles. We can at least start to lay the foundation. Right, so I would argue, uh, and look forward to having discussion on this, that uh, if we're truly to think about cyber, that it's a domain where all the opportunities, vulnerabilities, and constraints are, are combined in code. The software that runs on our systems, the firmware that runs on our devices, that's all code. And so moving forward from that, there are plenty of domains, though, that rely on code and seek that as perhaps the first principle. Uh, so what makes it a domain of warfare then is this conflict in code for control. And so I believe this is an incredibly concise statement that can help us reason about what is cyber and what isn't. And it's also one where we can build some corollaries and first principles from. Uh, fortunately, this has, I believe, great parallels to the hacker ethic. Uh, so you see here Mudge from Loft Heavy Industries, the hacker collective uh, from the 90s, stating that uh, the goal is to get technology to do things it was never intended to. I think there's incredible parallels between that and this conflict in code for control. And so that's, uh, I think, great ties uh, to the community there. This first principle, though, in order to apply it, uh, certainly requires some additional thinking uh, and perhaps some corollaries that we can pull from. And so I, I speak now briefly of four, and I look forward to a discussion of what may be many uh, of the dual-edged nature of abstraction the winner-take-all uh, elements of asymmetry in the domain, the compounding returns of expertise, and then finally, the intent that can only be actioned in this domain through the tools that we have. And again, building on that first principle that cyber truly is conflict in code for control. As we turn to abstraction, this is where we can see the foundations of the domain and great linkages to computer science. Uh, you see Aho and Ullman referenced here, uh, two great computer scientists who quite literally wrote the book. And they're talking about abstraction being uh, finding that right model uh, that addresses problems and then solves it with mechanizable techniques. Uh, so we, you don't need to be a computer scientist to understand abstraction. Uh, every time you open up a browser, uh, click a link, and a web page is presented to you, content from across the world, uh, you're experiencing the great power of abstraction right there. Uh, with that simple model, that simple and powerful model that unlocks the potential of the domain, uh, you no longer have to worry about the great complexity of the operating system, the network stack, and all the protocols that go on that must be gotten right in order for that to happen. As we seek to uh, apply this, these principles of abstraction, 
uh, to this conflict in code for control, you can see that it's truly within code uh, where these abstractions are manifest. That's their physical manifestation within the domain. And what this, what code does is it allows us to unlock the great potential and slay the complexity of the domain. At the end of the day, it's uh, commands being executed uh, on transistors, but we don't have to think about any of that. Uh, but also, uh, this is where all the gaps and vulnerabilities of the domain are introduced. Uh, the Professor Sergey brought us has an incredibly uh, evocative uh, way of phrasing this, uh, termed as weird machines. Uh, these vulnerabilities in these, at the gaps uh, that in imbue the domain with its nature. So building from that what, and specifically looking at vulnerabilities, uh, we can see that that's where we get this great asymmetry. Again, referencing uh, joint publication on how it describes asymmetry. Uh, we can see that uh, those vulnerabilities are perhaps best thought of the inherent weaknesses in our systems. Uh, there is no system that is completely secure. I think we've seen that time and time again. Uh, what then is left to us operating the domain is either uh, determining those vulnerabilities uh, to maintain control uh, through, mitigation, through mitigating techniques or to gain control through exploitation techniques. And it truly is a winner-take-all battle. In the, for the presence of any single given vulnerability that's discovered, uh, you either have the option of having a mitigation uh, in place in code or having an exploit to which would allow you control of that code. I think this, this winner-take-all nature is incredibly powerful. To put it uh, in the context of an example, you can look at the SQL Slammer Worm from 2003, quite literally the epitome uh, of asymmetry there. A single packet, many thousand times smaller than even just this presentation, uh, in just 10 minutes was able to bring the internet to its knees and compromise a significant number of hosts. And so this is that nature of conflict in code. Last year at Cyber Talks, uh, there was a great debate on whether the cyber domain operates at net speed or at human speed. And I'd say this asymmetry indicates how it could potentially be both. Uh, at the point of execution, the SQL Slammer worm uh, was very clearly operating at machine speed. Uh, the underlying uh, fact behind it, though, is that this vulnerability had been identified, published, and patched more than six months in advance uh, of this operation. And so that's an incredible human speed time uh, when the execution, uh, when it's in, in code, is at net speed. So from the, these uh, areas of the domain, we have perhaps, uh, to channel an earlier talk, some of the what and the where of how this domain operates. Uh, expertise truly captures the who, and, and even to the point of that depth of abstraction that one can operate at. Uh, you see some traits there, the attitude, aptitude, and ability that, that define this expertise, and really that ability to operate at a deeper level. Uh, we're faced with these users all across our organizations, our units, uh, and this is how expertise, I think, could potentially be binned in terms of understanding uh, its application to the domain. Uh, you have black box users, uh, perhaps those that can understand uh, just procedural tasks of how to use a system. Uh, turn it on, turn it off. And there is a large pool of people who operate at that level that we must take into account. Uh, beyond that, with additional depth of mastery, perhaps through training, but still in a non-procedural space, are, are tool users, those who can creatively combine existing capabilities and tools uh, to address new problems. And then finally, the most powerful of all, you have those who can create in this domain, those who can uh, have that understanding to program and operate at a depth of abstraction uh, that allows them to understand uh, those gaps and those vulnerabilities that are introduced. From that, uh, clearly having a strong reference to tools, and, and I would argue that, uh, that it, humanity has understood tools from the great philosopher kings of antiquity, uh, you know, you see Archimedes here referencing the great power of tools. Uh, for us in this domain, in the domain of code, it's those tools uh, that translate what we might want to do, our intent, into the actual actions that we are capable of doing and conducting. And it's only through tools and only through code that that is possible. There's no amount of just try harder in cyber that sometimes necessarily gets you there. From here, I'll pause now for those playing bingo for the obligatory XKCD comments. And so in terms of thinking about tools, uh, you have Joshua Corman here, uh, CSO for a, a company who, and great thinker in the domain, who is captured in the uh, theories of Moore's Law, H.D. Moore's Law, H.D. Moore being the creator of Metasploit, uh, the powerful penetration testing toolkit. And he would argue that casual attacker power grows at the rate of Metasploit. And so really linking the ability in the domain uh, and the ability to operate being closely tied to tools. 
I would argue as we seek to potentially generalize that and apply it to all of cyber, it could be stated not just for attackers, but for defenders as well, that all actors in this domain and their capacity for control grows at the rate of their tools. Obviously, not everyone is constrained just to Metasploit. Uh, and so when you have people operating at that high level of expertise where they're creators, uh, that's truly where you get great power when you're able to develop tools and able to then uh, more clearly translate your intent into action within the domain. And so looking at this, uh, I'll, I'll summarize now that I, I would claim that cyber truly is, if we're looking at it from a first principles perspective, conflict and code for control, that many of the elements of this domain can be understood through these corollaries, uh, the dual-edged sort of abstraction, the winner-take-all nature of asymmetry, the compounding returns of expertise, and the intent only possible to be action through tools. I would claim that uh, these are some first principles. I, I believe there are potentially many more and would love to have the discussion on this. I think uh, from first principles in a framework is only useful as the questions that you can use it to address. So here are some uh, questions. You know, what type of resource are we building in the cyber mission force? What is its potential? What are its limitations? What is possible at the core level and below for cyberspace operations? What is uh, not what we might want to happen, but what is feasible in this domain with the expertise that we have and the capabilities that we can produce? And then finally, how do we maximize the effectiveness of our expertise? I obviously have a very uh, military bent to this, but I think the same lessons can be applied uh, within industry and any who considers themselves a uh, cyberspace professional uh, and seeks to uh, understand this domain. In, in conclusion, I, I would implore, uh, if you consider yourself a cyberspace professional, uh, to, whenever possible, seek to understand the dom domain deeply uh, and reason about it from first principles rather than by analogy and metaphor. There's certainly a place for them, uh, but by having a good, strong base, we can pick the right and the powerful metaphors. Uh, and so now I'd like to open it up to questions and hopefully starting a discussion on this topic. Captain Ragdale, I have a question for you, back here. Uh, you mentioned first principles, and that means something in other disciplines, that it's right every time in the model. The experimentation, you enter the, you enter the variables and the results come out. In cyber, or software engineering, or computer science, or other man-made domains, they don't quite exist the same way. Moore's law is a rule of thumb. It's almost right, and all the variables can change with the, you can kind of get a result. So I challenge what you're saying there as first principles, there may not be the first principles in this domain, and you're, you're kind of chasing or we're going down a direction as if there is such a thing, and we really are in the analogous stage, and we always will be there. And by proclaiming that there are first principles, we're starting out with a fundamental belief that uh, is not agreed upon. Yeah, fantastic point, sir. I think that if you think about the problem, uh, so certainly each domain uh, understands first uh, principles differently. So in science, uh, you have uh, experimentation and laws. In mathematics, uh, where uh, you have theorems and lemmas and, and uh, axioms there. I think that if we can try and understand it at a deeper level, uh, perhaps the uh, wording is imprecise, but I would argue that uh, there is nothing that is cyber uh, that is not conflict and code for control. So I think that is one that need no, as a first principle, uh, need no supporting evidence. Uh, and we should seek to strive to understand or, or determine uh, you know, what those uh, elements are. I couldn't hear the question, sir. It's not on? Better now, obviously. Sorry about that. But anyway, I'm an ops research analyst on the air staff. And I was in, in light of the discussion about first principles, I'm curious how many in the room here are four nines, ORSAs in the Army actually studying cyber performance and effects and trying to put that into a war fighting context? Over. No, it's a fantastic question. Not an ORSA myself. Couldn't. Uh, speak to who in the Army or the uh, Joint Services is specifically taking on that task. I, I think it'd be helpful if we all consider it from this uh, mechanism and obviously the greater amount of, of thinking and uh, potentially from a um, deep perspective that we can apply. 
really wants to. Sir, I'm curious, from a human factor standpoint, how would you apply that to your first principles? For example, let's take cultural, cultural sides. So how would you entertain those into the first principles that you're discussing? Cultural. So Russians attack differently than Chinese, for example, in the exploitation of vulnerabilities? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so I think uh, when you look at uh, how you could potentially build uh, tactics and strategy from these first principles, uh, if you seek to understand what type of force that you have. Uh, so I'd argue that uh, largely right now uh, we have a force of tool users and there's some inherent constraints and limitations there. Uh, and certainly you'd want to train and use those forces differently. Um, I think there's uh, a range of different operations and different uh, tactics and strategies that would be applicable specifically uh, based on the type of force that you have uh, and then also in terms of the policy and potentially some of the moral framework that you might be trying to operate within. Roy, this is Rick Howard. Um, I'm your primary diaper changer when you were young. Thank you. <laughs> Much appreciated. I don't have a question, but I just want to comment on uh, first principle of coding. Uh, we've all tried to hire the right expertise to come work for us. Right? I have a, I've had security operations centers filled with people that have never programmed before. Right? And they cannot possibly understand what's going on if they don't have that background. Right, and so they're trying to get it. They try to get in the security space because it's cool and it's sexy. They take a couple of CISSP classes, but they've never coded anything. They don't have to be professional coders, developers, but they have to understand the practice because everything comes to that. I think that's no, absolutely. And maybe to uh, circle back around to the, the culture, and um, I, I think there's absolutely a space for for those who potentially can't code, uh, but we need to understand their constraints and limitations and, and appropriately apply those resources. Um, th there is a way that we can bring many more people to bear on this problem. Uh, I think at the very high end, though, it requires that depth of expertise uh, where the right person, uh, kind of in uh, some of the terms of industry, you have your 10 times performers uh, and you know, some of the constraints of communication uh, indicated from software engineering disciplines, like the mythical man month. Uh, those are hard constraints in this domain, also all premised in, in code. Uh, Colonel Andy Hall, Army Staff G1, uh, Operations Research Analyst, Computer Scientist, Mathematician. Uh, I wanted to, to comment on, on something similar to the coding we just heard about, but uh, I would offer to you uh, to get your thoughts on the, the part of what we do that is coding and the part that is uh, officership. Because uh, I believe that there is a role in what you do in the battalion, in the brigade, in the for the cyber units that is officership and that that has a, a role in what we're doing that's uh, different from what we need our warrants and our enlisted to do. Absolutely. Uh, so I certainly agree with you. I've been incredibly fortunate to have great leaders in this domain who understand uh, some of these principles and who have uh, been willing to apply that technical expertise. I don't think the value of a leader in this domain is because of the technical work that they're going to necessarily produce. Uh, but I would argue that our soldiers, warrants, and civilians in this domain certainly deserve leadership that can understand and think about it deeply uh, in order to relate to them and, and the problems that they face. I'm Jan Hamby. I'm the chancellor at the I College, and I retired after 32 years in the Navy in the C4 space. And by the way, I think I was at West Point in Double E and CS as an exchange officer when your dad was off getting his PhD, maybe? I don't know if he recalls my He's name right now. his time. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I never changed your diaper. Um, but the, the comment I have and the opportunity for you to respond is on the choice of words in that you, or I should say in the choice of not using words, you've used a shorthand here because you have a first principle for cyber. Mm -hmm. Now, old school, cyber is an adjective, it is not a noun. So is this shorthand for cyber warfare specifically? And I think that's where we could have some issue with the first principle of conflict in code for control. Because cyber to me is much broader than just cyber warfare itself and it's a bit of a cautionary note that we have to be careful about how we use words mm -hmm. because cyber is also sexy out there and people want to sprinkle cyber pixie dust on all their programs to try and get money. So if you could expand upon your use of the word cyber, mm -hmm. is it a co-opting of the word for this purpose 
or is it a shorthand for this purpose? Uh, so I would almost certainly fall on the side of, uh, if you're going to call it a co-opting, uh, I think that uh, it see, I seek to address uh, some of that sprinkling, put some cyber on this. We, we've certainly all heard that. Uh, I would argue that there are other domains that truly, in other uh, fields, uh, that have pieces of this that are related. Uh, I think that if we define cyber this way, uh, it is much more crystallizing and applicable. I, I think that this is uh, relevant uh, not just from a warfare perspective, uh, but really from that adversarial nature uh, that is imbued in the hacker ethic. takes away the opportunity where cyber is used in situations that are unrelated to conflict, that are unrelated to warfare. It, you know, if you want to think about the Navy's global force for good kind of mentality, whether it be within military industry outside, cyber aspects play throughout the spectrum from peace to warfare. So that, that's where I have the rub with the conflict in code. Unless you modify so it's a first principle for cyber warfare or a first principle for cyber space operations or the like. No, th thank you for your feedback, ma'am. I, I would hope, or you know, my personal belief is that it uh, could capture that broader sense and that there's elements in those uh, applied domains uh, where there is conflict, uh, you know, maybe not to the point of overt warfare. I hesitate very much to uh, make a comment or a question. I'll, I'll make no reference to any prior knowledge I have of the speaker. But, but if I could, he can certainly speak for himself, and I want to highlight that this is effectively original thinking on his part. I want to make sure that's very clear. This is an idea that he developed, and there's a part of it that I was very enthused with, and it gets to the earlier question about how culture comes to play. I think when we talk about cyber, we talk past each other much. But by introducing conflict, and I can think conflict, I, I'm fundamentally opposed to putting warfare or operations after the word. It's out there as its own individual word, not as an adjective. But when you put conflict in front, conflict is not warfare. Conflict is crime. Conflict is somebody that wants to influence you on the highway. Somebody is, so conflict is sufficiently broad. And what it does, I believe, is it brings into this discipline all of those human factors it brings in culture, it brings in sociology, it brings in law, it brings in ethics. All the things we know belong there. I think the ACI has, is an embodiment of that thinking because it's not just a bunch of computer wonks. Because there's certainly a technical part of this, but there is this way of describing cyber, I think, pulls in all of those other, where I think there is greater potential for progress in this space looking at the conflict side of this than there is in the technical side. We have to continue to lead the world technologically, but I think we can now leverage with this sort of a fundamental definition all those other disciplines that should come to play in this very important space. So not a question, just a comment, and I'm Can't sure we'll hear about it later, but I had to do so. Sir, Sir I'm a, I'm a known hater of our previous analogies. Haters got to hate, as we yeah. know. Um, because it's, it's brought us to this, you know, seeking these, the heinous word effects. We're looking for effects, right? Mm. Uh, what I like, and this isn't an analogy, too, let's face it, but it, it's, it's what comes after that phrase that's important. So conflict in code for control of what? And so uh, that leads us to start thinking about and having our uh, leaders who want things to say, what do you want to control? Do you want to control their, their minds, their stuff, all those sort of things? So it, it's helpful in uh, providing us a way of thinking about it. And so I, I'm uh, quite uh, happy with it. I think it, I, it can be extended and, and, uh, and used quite extensively in talking to our combat arms leaders to, to, to force them to say, what do you want to control? So we have that uh, problem we have with the perennial problem. Uh, what, what do you want? What, what do you have? <laughs> that discussion we have even with the National Security Council, that we say, you have to tell us what you want to achieve before we can uh, give you good effects. And so this kind of thinking leads you to, to them to think, well, here's what I want to control. I want to control their water, or I want to control their psyche, or whatever. 
and then that leads us to good thinking in cyberspace. So I commend you. Good job. No, thank you very much, sir. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tona Trice from 310th and My Battalion in Analyst. Um, you mentioned during your comments that there's a space here for people who can't code. And I would suggest that perhaps you re rethink that. Um, in today's world, pre-literate children can code. There are many things that teach you how to function as a coder. And when you're thinking of order of battle, your tools can only go so far if your energy is put into building GUIs so that people who can't code and can't understand the fundamentals of this domain can participate. So perhaps as you build this out further, because I think that the conflict in code for control is great, consider what that means as a base level of skill necessary to operate in cyber, as opposed to in human, in CI, in any other domain where people are using computers, but it's not cyber. Oh, ma'am, thank you for that point. Uh, so, so I absolutely agree with the criticality of being able to code. I would love if every single one of you in here uh, was able to code at a great level as I would like for all of our cyber mission forces to be able to, to code. I, I'd say when you, when you look at how I laid out the expertise levels and kind of you look at a black box user, I'd say we've seen uh, incredible examples uh, where we've deployed essentially black box technologies uh, with deployed at the tactical level for uh, great effects uh, through tactical SIGIN or, or many other mechanisms. If you look at black box systems that you can procure publicly, uh, for example, uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple, or I saw a great article the other day in terms of uh, USB fry stick that you plug it in and uh, using electricity. Um, uh, again, I think that there's a space for uh, those type of operations. I think to the point of uh, tools, I, when I, I use two tools very broadly uh, to mean not just uh, GUIs or graphical user interfaces, I would consider uh, Metasploit or any of the command line tools uh, as well to be in that space. I, I think that there's a uh, great power that those tools can provide uh, and you are able to have a number of uh, less expert uh, actors uh, able to operate in that space uh, with those tools and then kind of gaining asymmetry from the capabilities provided. Part of the great power of Metasploit is that you and I don't have to figure out each and every new exploit that comes out. Uh, we don't have to uh, have that depth of expertise. It'd be fantastic if we did, uh, but we can employ them without that understanding. Uh, arguably, it would be certainly much better if we could. I, I think that we're somewhat constrained in terms of the population uh, that does have that uh, expertise and that depth of uh, mastery. Roy, thank you very much for continuing, I think, a very necessary conversation with your presentation. I'll present to you on behalf of ACI and the Army Cyber Command your black badge. <laughs>